All right, so good morning, everybody. And um, if you would, this morning, turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. When you get to Ephesians, go to chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Going to handle a little something this morning that uh, it might be a little bit of a different approach the way I do it than the way you've heard it from others, and that's okay. You may agree, you may disagree, that's okay. But I'm going to attempt to show it this morning. We're going to talk a little bit this morning. We've had about six to eight weeks of laying down some foundational truths and those original building blocks, if you will. And now we're going to come up to a place, uh, we're going to talk about walking, our walk, right? And we're going to talk about that walk, as I said, a little bit differently than what a lot of people do. And let me say this, and let me preface this. I know that when Paul talks about our walk, he does warn us about the flesh, okay? So don't, don't take that I'm not on, on board with that. But what I do want you to see is something deeper than just your flesh, right? I want you to see something that Paul warns the believer about uh, over and over again. And so we want to look at uh, chapter 4, starting here at verse 1. 4 and 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another in love. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for this day, another day of your grace, your mercy, and your long-suffering upon all men. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God rightly divided. We thank you that we have the Word of God to divide, the Word of truth. We give you the praise, we give you the honor, we give you the glory for all that you've done for us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you put him on a cross, shed his blood, buried him, raised him again the third day under glory, we give you all the praise, all the thanks, all the honor, and all the glory. And everyone said, Amen. So in the walk here... Um, Go back and look at uh, chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, now that should trigger something there. He starts off the chapter, I therefore. Well, if I therefore starts the chapter, there must be something before, right? So keep that in your mind. When you read the Bible, keep that in mind. I therefore. He doesn't just start this random chapter that says I therefore. He's expounding up on something that came before. So therefore he's saying... I therefore beseech you, right? The, he said, I, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. When Paul uses that terminology and what was taught to me years ago to walk worthy, it's not walking to be worthy. Understand me? We've already seen this morning in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. So this is not about working to be worthy. It's not about walking to be worthy. This is walking worthy of something that Christ has already made you in him, right? You've already made you something. Walk worthy of what he has made you. Now look how you do it here in verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another in love. In what love? My love, your love for me, you'll love me and, and start not loving me before this message is done, right? I'll offend you or say something you don't like or a way you don't like it and you'll stop loving me at that moment. You might start again next week. No, it's a love of Christ here. I truly believe that, that when we get deeper into this, this teaching, you're going to see this love of Christ develop. And this is what Paul is describing that we want worthy of this. This love of Christ and all that came from the gospel of Christ, all that came from the power of God when he raised him from the dead. And that, that power now has allowed us to be made something that we never could be made. We couldn't walk, work, or do anything to get there. But now that you are that, because of his doings, what worthy of it? And do it in love. And you will the more you get a hold of this, this gospel, the more you get a hold of this justification message, the more you get a hold of the finished cross work of Jesus Christ, the more you will see that love, right? And you'll see it play out. Look at lowliness of mind. Now the difference of lowliness of mind would be what? High-minded, wouldn't it? Look over at Romans chapter 11 real quick. Romans in chapter 11. So the difference of 
lowliness of mind would be a highness of mind, if you will. And the Bible calls that high-minded. And he warns the Gentiles here in chapter 11 about the very thing. So when you get there to chapter 11, look down at 19 and 20. <clears throat> look at 19. He said, Thou will say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. See that? 11, 19. Now watch verse 20. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not what? Be not high-minded, but fear. Look over 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. You get to 1 Timothy, look at chapter 6 with me. Chapter 6, when you get there, go to verse 17. Six and seventeen, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not what? Do you know of anybody that opens the Bible and they're rich in this world? They're all over the place, aren't they? And they're telling you how to get rich in this world. What does Paul say? Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust uncertain riches. How many trust the riches? Most of them. This is why God's so good to me, right? He's so good to me because I'm doing so good. That's high-minded, right? But in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. See that? Look over at 2 Timothy. Look there at chapter 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incompetent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof from such to turn away. I just gave you the world system. We were talking about that. Stephanie was outside there during the break about the world system. When people look at the world in general, general, what do they see? They see lost people. They see sinners. They see fornicators. They see adulterers. They see drunkards. They see whoredom. And they say, that's the world. Now let me say something. Satan has set up a world. A world system. And in that world system, you have find the word religion. That is to rebind, to reconfine is what it means. It's to bind you, right? And so what that system is designed to do is designed to corrupt your mind. It's designed to get you to walk according to the rule of this world instead of the rule of Christ. And by doing that, you will have in your mind indoctrinated that you're doing the work of the Lord. Did Paul believe that he was doing the work of the Lord when he was putting those people to death back there? Yeah. Absolutely, he thought he was doing it. Hey, he got a memo one day, didn't he? Yeah. He got something that said, hey, Saul, Saul, yeah. why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? Yeah. Right? And probably shaking, thinking, please don't let it be Jesus Christ. Please don't let it be the one that I said was a phony back there. Please don't let it be the one that I blasphemed. Please don't let it be the one that I was killing people because they believed he was the Messiah. So look at this thing closely. Look at Philippians. And I'm going I'm to tie a couple knots and we're going to go forward in this, this teaching this morning. And as I said, I know I'm probably not going to show it like others do. But I want to show this walk. I want to show this walk. This is not what you want. That's not walking worthy of the calling. Might I ask you a question this morning? Is it possible for a person to walk worthy of a calling that they have no idea of the calling? So what would be really, really important if we were going to walk would be to know something, right? It would be to know your identity. See, I've said it a long time ago. Some of this stuff gets redundant. Until you know where you're seated, you'll never be able to walk. Until you're walking, you'll never be able to stand. 
Right? That, that's just the way the book is laid out in the book of Ephesians. So God is over this over here. And this is the body of Christ. And in that body of Christ, we have a new identity. And that's a new man. He's a spiritual man that's been looked over, who's been starved out by this program over here to get you walking that way. Right? And that's not walking worthy of the Lord. Go look over in Ephesians 4 and verse 17. I told you Philippians. Stop at Philippians. I'm sorry. Philippians. Look at verse 5. And we're going to talk about lowliness here, right? 2 and 5. Philippians 2 and 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. See that? That's lowly, isn't it? And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, now watch, lowliness gets exalted. Right? So watch it. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So while we're here and we're walking worthy of the calling wherewith we've been called, our job is not to go out and build reputations. Our job is not to go out and say, look at me. Our job is to walk lowly with, with, with peace and love, right? Endeavoring to keep the unity of the peace. That's our job. Right? Well, you know what's going to happen if we do that? At some point, we're going to be exalted as God's trophies of grace. Right? For all eternity. I can just imagine somebody saying in eternity, God, would you show me your grace? Would you give me your understanding of your grace? I, I'm not saying it's like this. Don't get a tattoo, right? I ain't saying it's like this. But what if he just pointed over and said, there's Willie. There's Donnie. There's Roy. There's Leonard. <laughs> that you want grace, there it is. Right? See, he took a barb at me on the way out. And I told him, when the camera comes on, you're exposed. But see, that's what God could look at us and say, that there's grace. Look here in, um, in Ephesians again, in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 17. <clears throat> this I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So I will stop right there. I do know that Paul deals and he warns us about the sins of the flesh. He does, right? But I want you to think today, us being Gentiles, right? And we're all kind of basically, everybody today really is looked at as a Gentile, right? God doesn't have a favorite nation today. I know people fight that, but he don't. What do you think the vanity of the mind of a Gentile that ought to be over here, what if they're operating over here? Is that vanity? Are they having their understanding darkened over here? They are, aren't they? So they're, they're going through a system that Satan is using and they're trying to please God through that system when God by the Spirit is working over here in a new identity in the body of Christ to a new man, all things spiritual, right? And over here, this over here is mechanical and Satan is blinding the hearts and minds with this system over here and people want to operate here thinking they're walking worthy of their calling. Well, if they don't know their identity, they can't walk worthy of their identity. If, if I made him a police officer, but, I but he thought he was a fireman, he'd do something different, wouldn't he? He wouldn't be out here being a police officer. He'd go fight fires. Hey, Willie, uh, you need to get back in your lane, buddy. You're a police officer, right? He's got to know his identity to know how to walk. That's what I'm getting at. Simple, basic, but I'm, I'm going to build on it. I want to show you. Look back over now in, in verse uh, chapter, chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians real quick. That walking worthy there is to say that God has made us something. Let us walk according to this rule. The rule of what he's made me. The rule of what he says I am in him. Right? Not a rule that I can make up for myself and say, I'll just serve him this way. It's all the same. 
I'll go ahead and go do this because that's what mama did, daddy did. That's how they, I, I was brought up this way, so I'm going to function this way. God's not going to have a part of that, right? God has declared the terms. It doesn't matter what program you're in, God's declared the terms. And God is saying over here, set not your affections on things of the earth, which is exactly what they teach you to do. The Spirit is saying, set your affections on Jesus Christ, what He's done for you, what He's made you. Yeah. Right? Something totally different. Where your new man is, is in Christ Jesus the Lord. Does everybody, has everybody heard where your new man is at? Do you know you're seated with Christ? Yeah. In Christ in heavenly place. If you never nail that down, you'll never be able to walk worthy of it. You'll never be able to walk, period, correctly until you know exactly who you are and where you are. Right? That's the trouble when you don't rightly divide the word of truth. Look here in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. Start at verse 1. We see us it feels like every Sunday. Uh, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. We talked about this morning what ministry we had received. It was that ministry of reconciliation to explain to people that God's not counting their sins toward them, that God is not judging them, that God is not angry with them. God has left them in a place to be reconciled in Him by believing the testimony of His Son when He put Him on the cross to die for their sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. That that's God's terms for being reconciled reconciled unto God, right? To be reconciled with God, to have peace with God. God's at peace with you. He's not angry. He's not striking people down, as some say, for their sin, because we live in a time of grace and peace. It's called the dispensation of grace of God. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking, notice that, in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. What happens in this over here? Those very things that he just described. Craftiness, deceitfulness, twisting the scripture. Peter called it resting the scripture. This is not the walk you want. All right. So, no, but by manifest, manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world over here has blinded them that believe what? They believe not. Right? Yeah. Understand that? When we say the gospel and we talk about Christ dying for our sins, being buried and raised again the third day for our justification, I need you to understand the good news that falls out of that event back here at the cross is a continuum of Paul's doctrine. When he talks about this, he talks about how God has reconciled the world unto himself. He talks about how Christ was made to be sin for us. That's good news as well that Satan is trying to blind people to. And he's winning. I hate to say it. Most people are walking according to this right here instead of this over here. This has a bigger payoff today. Right? I get goodies. I get things. I get health. I get wealth. I get notoriety. I get reputation. That's not lowliness of mind. That's a high-minded person. Religion will build you up in your mind to be high-minded. Let me ask you this question. How much more high-minded could you be when God Almighty says that He put Christ on the cross, made Him to be sin for you, that you might be made the righteous of God in Him? How high-minded can you be to sit and say, that's not enough, I need to go over here and do this? That's pretty high-minded, isn't it? See, the lowliness of mind and the walk that Paul's talking about with worthiness here, it comes back to a faith of a teaching, a doctrine, if you will, about what Christ is, who He is, what He did, what He accomplished without your help. Amen. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your help to justify you. All He needs you to do is believe and trust Him. Right? So watch here closely. He blinded the minds of them to believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Notice that. The gospel of Christ, the power of God, to salvation to all who will believe it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the power of God. Well, if that's the power of God to save your never dying soul, and I'm Satan over this world over here, how do I want you to walk? I want you to walk away from the cross and get into your own self. 
I want you to, be, to get high-minded thinking you can do something to save yourself. Think you can keep a law. Think you can keep a rule. Think you can shine up and you can do what's necessary. And that's the way they teach it, by the way, to walk worthy. Become worthy. No. Walk worthy of what he's already made you in this new identity over here. Right? Now look here at the next part of this. Who is the image of God? That it should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Right? So there's something in this whole thing about walking worthy that somehow we only see one portion of it. We only see the sins of the flesh and we don't see the doctrinal content of what Paul wants you to see about walking to a certain rule. And I'm going to show you that certain rule when we tie all this down. All right. So now look, look over in chapter five of, of Ephesians. Chapter five of Ephesians. If there's one intent that a lot of men have is to get people to go to work. Yep. And we're not, we're not really and truly, it, it, it's, it's get them saved and get them to go do some work. Sure. Let's get Christ formed in them and let's let the Spirit of God and the Word of God work its way out of them. Let's let that be the motivating factor. Let's let the, the, the thing that Paul is teaching and that Paul has given us, let that build up into us that we might be created, we are created into his good work and let us walk in them because it's spirit driven. Right? So look here in chapter 5 of Ephesians and when you get there to 5, look at verse 2. And walk in love. Now notice Notice, as Christ loved us and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. See that? Well, then Paul follows with sins of the flesh. I want you to see the walk in love. How do you walk in love? He says, as Christ loved us, right? So what should be the motiv motivating factor? The love of Christ. You got it? So look back over in chapter 5 of Romans. Hold your, uh, your, your place there in Ephesians. Look at 5.5. 5. And hope make of not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. It's the love of God. You see that? When you start to understand the love of God, your motive of love changes, don't it? You know, most people in this system over here, they think it's their love for God. That's going to get them somewhere. No, the scripture's clear here. It's the love of God. Go back to 2 Corinthians and chapter 5, 2 Corinthians and chapter 5 again. Second Corinthians and chapter 5. When we get there, let's look down at verse 14. For the love of Christ, see that? It constraineth us. Now watch what it does. Because we thus judge, we consider this whole thing. We judge it all the way out. Right? We go back and we look on it and we say, wow, that if one died for all, then they were all what? They were all dead. And that he died for all, they which live should not live hence more, henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. What constrains you to do that? It's the love of Christ. It's you in this identity looking back over here at the finished cross work of Jesus Christ that needs nothing added to it. That constrains you now to walk according to the identity in which he has given you in Christ. Right? You know what it'll also do? It'll make you sick of this junk over here. Because over that, it's just how good I can get to get God to love me. No. We love him, 
And he loves us because he told us he loves us. And he showed that demonstration of love right there on the cross. And this is what constrains us. This is what develops the good walk. And the good walk is no good without a course. Right? And we're not walking to this course, but we're walking to this course. And might I say, not everybody's at the same place in their walk. Right? It's what you have attained to. Let us walk as such as we've attained to it. Right? You understand so far? Because I'm, I'm going to paint the picture just a little, little further right here to help, you, to help you along in all this. I wanted you to see that it's not just our love for Christ. It's Christ's love for us. That love that we realize who we were, what we were, we were no good. Does anybody in here feel like you're worthy of God's love? No. Do you feel like you're worthy of God's grace? If you do, you're not saved. Right, something wrong. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true. I'm giving you the truth. Mm -hmm. Now I told you she's going to quit liking me and that probably did it right there. Yeah. Right? Look over here at um, Ephesians 5.15. I get it, man. This book right here, it means so little to people. And you know what that book is? It's life. It's spirit. It's truth. It's everything you need. You need that worse than you need your britches you wear. You need that worse than you need your lunch today. Right? People pass on it. Don't want it. Don't need it. Get tired of hearing it. Well, I'm telling you, if you don't like it here, you're going to hate heaven. It ain't going to be good for you. I'm telling you now, it ain't going to be good for you. Look here at 515 of Ephesians. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Anybody become wise to this garbage over here? You saw there wasn't no good in that, didn't you? Yeah. You saw that that world over there, and by, let me say this, folks, this is the one that's so attractive down here. Yeah. Okay? It's attractive. It'll have you doing spiritual selfies. Look at me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> this one over here will have you esteeming yeah. what matters. Yeah. And Paul goes there. He don't talk about selfies, but he goes there. Right? That's what this joint over here does for you. Me. Yeah, me. Sort of hey man, turn the tube on. You'll get it. Yeah. How you become a giant over your faith. He says walk circumspectly. What does that mean? Cautiously. Be aware of your footsteps. Know who you are. Know where you're going. Know what you're walking after. And be aware of that over there. Right? I'm telling you all, Paul's warning these people of the flesh and also the spiritual nature of the system that devil's got set up. And I'm going to show it to you. Go back and look at four. When he told them to walk circumspectly, you go back here to four and see what he was talking about. Look at verse 14. That we henceforth be no more what? Toss to and fro. Yeah. This one over here will toss you. Yes, it does. You know how it'll toss you? Yeah. Should I go to the <laughs> altar and pray? Should I pray through to God? Um, should I get 10%, 20%? Should I be water baptized, standing up, laying down, sprinkling on the head, dunk? What, it, it, well, he says I can lose my salvation. He's really good, says I can't. <laughs> Back and forth. That's the course of this world over here. This over here is an identity that you know God has already done it. He already believed it. He's already made you that. He, he became what you were so that you could become what you could never be. Amen. You became righteous in him and he became sin for you. This system over here does not acknowledge that. This system over here says keep a short account. Come down and pray over your sins. Lay your sins on the altar. Wherever that's at. Right? This one over here says, you've forgiven all your trespasses. All your sins are gone. They were put on Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. How many believe that? Amen. How many believe this is a better walk? Amen. Right? Yeah. How many believe that's a better walk? 
This one over here is a, a little bit of the Colossians chapter 1. Look there with me real quick. Colossians in chapter 1. <clears throat> Look at verse 13. I want you to notice who hath is that past tense? Yes. All right. Now, what has he done? Deliverance. From the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Well, in the teachings of your identity, did it teach you that you were already seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places? Yes. So what did he do? He spiritually translated you out of darkness, the world system, if you will, and he placed you into the kingdom of his dear son, that's the spiritual realm which is called heaven. Amen? Amen. And he puts you in Jesus Christ in heavenly places, calls you to sit there, sit there, right? Amen. He sealed you with that spirit. Your life is here with Christ in God. This system don't want you to know that. This is a blinding agency over here because it's set up by man. And it came straight from the portals of the early part of Genesis when they started building their own religion. And it's never stopped. And some people call themselves Protestants, Reformated, all that business, and they never got too far away from where it all started. They got to hold on to a piece of it. What makes you different is when you realize your identity in Christ has nothing to do with that business over there. They don't like you because they think you're a spiritual snob. I'm not a spiritual snob because none of this is based on me. It's all based on him. All right. Are you with me so far? All right. Now look here. In verse 9 of that same chapter of Colossians. <clears throat> For this cause we also since today we heard of it. He's talking about their faith there. Do not cease to pray for you. And to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now watch this. And all wisdom and what? Spirit, spiritual understanding. He ain't talking about putting, you know, rocket ships together. He's not talking about building a business. He's talking about spiritual understanding. Now look at verse 10. That you might, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So what is that walk? That walk is according to knowledge. It's according to wisdom. What knowledge and what wisdom? The knowledge and the wisdom of the identity that you've been given as a member of the body of Christ. When you believe the gospel and he baptized you into that death. He buried you in baptism. He raised you up spiritually. Seated you together in heavenly places. You have knowledge in Romans 2 Philemon that the devil is trying to block him blind. And he's been working at it for 2,000 years. That the, the natural guy, the ever day ruckety ruck like me cannot get it out of the natural right number one but even when he has been saved he wants to blind you from this truth he wants to keep you from understanding who you are in Christ because once you know who you're in Christ you'll know where you're seated you'll know how to walk and you'll know how to stand and he don't want that well look at the culmination of all those things look back over in Colossians in chapter 4 Colossians in chapter 4 Chapter 4, look down at verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salute for you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And Satan has blinded people to the will of God. All right? He has made them believe through this worldly system over here that the will of God is where they work. Yep. Right? Where they live. Yep. Who they date. Yep. Who they marry. Well, if the will of God was about marriage, 50% of it has fallen apart, so that would tell me it's not the will of God. Right? Over 50% of it. All right? In closing this morning, go back and look at Colossians 2 because we're going to wrap this thing up. Here. In just a few. Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Amen. 
How did you receive the Lord? By grace, through faith. So, I don't want to change the word of God. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him by grace through faith. That's how you should walk. You walk by what? Faith. faith. Romans 10, what, 17? Is that right? So you walk by faith. No, that's faith come by here and here by the word of God. Romans 10, 7 is walk, walk by faith. Am I right? But you walk by faith. Well, you received him. You received his grace. Now you're going to walk by that grace. And you're going to walk by faith in that grace because you're going to walk in Him. A member of the body of Christ could not walk in Christ according to the law because God's not going to acknowledge that because that's not what the Spirit is doing. The Spirit is showing us the grace of God that we have to walk by faith in the grace of God. You have to rest in the grace of God. You've got to put your faith in the grace of God. If you never hear anything else that I say or any other man says on the video, you listen to me closely right here because your eternal soul rides on it. You're going to have to put your faith in that right there, him dying for you, being buried and raised again, shedding his blood to atone for your sin. Your faith's going to rest in that and you're going to trust him or heaven won't be your home. You're going to walk according to that rule right there and you're going to miss out. Yes. Right. Yes. That's cool. You can't tell me that, Donnie. I do A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Keep on with the alphabet, brother, but that ain't getting you to heaven. You're going to have to believe and trust what he did. It's all on him. And this is what our apostle is trying to get us to see that we walk according to that, that we walk according to the rule of Christ and the grace of Christ and the faith of Christ and that we have nothing else mingled with that faith and grace. Amen. Not your nasty work, not your nasty membership to whatever club you're part of over here. Right? That's just gooder and gooder, ain't it? Yeah. All right. All right. So now, if you will, go over to Galatians. And this is where we're going to finish it all off. Galatians. When you get there, I want you to go to chapter 5. <laughs> I, I can't tell you anything is by feeling, right? I can't because the Bible doesn't say in one place if you feel this way. Right. When you feel like this, right, it doesn't say it. But I want to tell you something. Yeah. Every time I stand up here and I draw that cross and I start reflecting on what he did on that cross, I feel a certain way, man. I mean, I feel like a Ford Pinto that just got a Ferrari engine put in it. I mean, it just really ramps me up. Right? Because I know that that's the love of Christ that constrains me. Right? So look here in chapter 5. Now watch verse, verse 16 how it starts off. This I say then, walk. Notice the walk. Now we, we're teaching on walk this morning, right? Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, what's the lust of the flesh? Well, the Bible goes on and gives us some works of the flesh, doesn't it? Hold your finger right there. Hold your finger right there and just turn right over to Ephesians real quick and look at chapter 2. So this is why I said I was going to put a little different slant on it this morning. I was going to look at it just a little different. I do know that Paul's talking about flesh. I do know he's talking about the sins of the flesh. And he's warning us, but he's also, he's warning us about this over here. To walk after that worldly system. Look here in chapter 2 and verse 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the what? The course of this world. Now whether that was strictly according to the flesh. Or whether that was a religious hoodly do. You walked that way right? According to, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who was over that world? That one right up there. The same one is blinding the hearts of those who have believed not that the glorious gospel of the light of Jesus Christ might not shine unto them. Yeah. Amen. He's the one. The power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of dis disobedience. Now, y'all remember what Paul was doing? He remember, you remember Paul? He really thought he was doing the work of the Lord. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Paul thought he was doing the work of the Lord. So watch his flash here in verse 3. Among whom also we all, notice Paul lumped himself into that group, right? Had our conversation time past in the lust of our flesh. What was the lust of Paul's flesh? He was a, a religious zealot, right? 
So Paul's saying what can go down to the, the beer joint and shoot pool on Saturday night and get, get hammered, right? Go outside and smoke a joint and jump the rope. Paul's deal was to go put people to sleep because they were believing that Jesus Christ was, was a, the Messiah. His flesh said, I'm doing that. He was walking according to this thing over here thinking he was doing God a service. See that? You see how flesh can be more than just getting drunk. It can be more than just going out and having sexual relations, right? Right? It can be spiritual fornication. Taking the body of Christ and putting it under a program that it don't belong to is spiritual fornication. It's spiritual adultery and it creates a spiritual idolatry. Y'all with me? Well, you're getting harsh. Amen. All right, so then watch. Back in uh, Galatians there. In chapter 5. If anybody has a tuba, a horn, French harp, whatever you got, when I get to chapter 6, I want you to stand up and play it. All right, because we're going to... We're going, to throw a, we're going to throw a party when I get to chapter 6. So he says that uh, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusts is against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. That against that, that against that. You can't walk in Christ, you can't walk in grace by faith if you're trying to do this over here. Right? You're walking to the course of this world over here. Right? And these are contrary one to the other that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not in law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And he names off all those sins of the flesh. Now look down at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit. Notice your name is not right there. He doesn't say, but the fruit of Donnie or any of you. He says the fruit of the Spirit. Right, So the Spirit of God, when you understand your identity and who you are in this new man, this body of Christ that's been formed today, that's been overlooked by most preachers, pastors, and teachers, when you realize this, then the Spirit is able to form Christ in you through the Word of God, right and divided, that you might be able to walk accordingly, not to that, but unto this over here. In chapter 6 and finishing. And you can go back and read those points. On the fruit of the Spirit. And here we're going to go. Verse 12 of chapter 6. I read a verse here this morning that hit me different than it's ever hit me. Right? And it's amazing because all week I've been thinking about this study. But I'll show you the verse here in a moment. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecutions of the cross of Christ. Those who constrain you to be baptized in water, pay tithes, show up four times a week, go knock on doors, all the stuff that this system over here has you to do. It's fair show in the flesh that they might tell you, now you're probably saved. Yeah. That's the evidence. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may do what? Satan built the fleshly system. Y'all like it or don't like it, it's called religion. And it's a mockery of God's word because what they do, they go back to time past and they try to replicate what they can't replicate and they call it Christendom. Amen? Now you're going to choose how you're going to walk. Watch what Paul says. And this is where we ought to really start playing music. For God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I am the world. Paul said, I'm crucified to this system over here. I'm crucified unto the world, and that is crucified unto me. I have no need for it. I'm dead to it. It's dead to me. I forget those things which are behind. I count them but dung. Remember that? Yeah. Now watch verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new what? New man. New creature right there. This is the verse that hit me this morning. And it hit me in a way it hadn't hit me before. 
and as many. What are we talking about this morning? Walking? Watch this. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. Read it again. And as many as walk according to this rule, walk in worthy. Right? How's Paul say you're going to walk worthy there? All about the cross. God forbid should I glory in anything save the cross of Jesus Christ. God forbid if I put hope in anything except for the cross of Jesus Christ. God forbid if I raise a hand and say I did anything and take away from him. Walk according to that rule. Right? You want to know how to walk? Walk according to that rule. Grace be upon you in peace. Right? Walk according to the rule of what? The somebody else did all the work and I'm the benefactor. Right? Somebody else did all the work and I received all that came from it. Walk like that. That's how you walk ye in him. That's how you walk worthy. He made you this. Just walk in it. And always praise God for what Jesus Christ did. Amen? You can't go wrong. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful, so thankful for this day and every day that you've given us in the grace of God, your mercy, your love, your peace, your kindness toward us, the spirit of God that you've given us, the love of Christ that you've given us. Most of all, Lord, that he went to a cross, shed his blood, was buried, and he rose again the third day for our justification. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory for that. And everyone did say amen.